And let me welcome and introduce our guest speaker today. It's my great privilege and honor to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. David Jones, who's going to talk today about physicians and the climate crisis, history, politics, and ethics. Dr. Jones completed his AB at Harvard College in 1993 in history and science, and then pursued a PhD in the history of science at Harvard and received an MB at Harvard Medical School, both in 2001. After an internship in pediatrics at Children's Hospital and Boston Medical Center, he then trained as a psychiatrist at Mass General and McLean Hospital, and then worked for two years as a staff psychiatrist at the Cambridge Hospital. He then joined the faculty at MIT in 2005 as an assistant professor of history and culture of science and technology. And from 2004 to 2008, Professor Jones directed MIT's Center for the Study of Diversity in Science, Technology, and Medicine. In 2009, he was appointed as a McVicker Faculty Fellow in recognition of his sustained contributions to undergraduate education. He also has taught as a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School, where he was awarded the 2010 Donald O'Hara Faculty Prize for Excellence in Teaching. In 2011, he left MIT to join the Harvard faculty and became the inaugural A. Bernard Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine, a joint position between the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the Faculty of Medicine. In 2018, he received the Everett Mendelssohn Excellence in Mentoring Award from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and in 2020, he was named a Harvard College Professor. His initial research has focused on epidemics among American Indians, resulting in the book, Rationalizing Epidemics, Meanings and Uses of American Indian Mortality Since 1600, published in 2004 by the Harvard University Press. His next project, Broken Hearts, The Tangled History of Cardiac Care, published in 2013 by Johns Hopkins University, examined the history of decision-making in cardiac therapeutics. He has published widely in the New England Journal of Medicine, American Journal of Public Health, Bulletin of the History of Medicine, and Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, and among uh, other venues. And topics have included human subjects research, Cold War medicine, HIV, planetary um, health, race, and the COVID-19 pandemic. His research has been um, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, his teaching at Harvard explores the history of medicine, medical ethics, and social medicine. His three books in print are um, Rationalizing Epidemics, um, What's the Use of Race, Modern Governance, and Biology of Difference, and Broken Hearts. Um, for those of you who are interested, David wrote some absolutely terrific pieces in the New England Journal in the past two years about the COVID um, pandemic and how history is relevant. And I'll see if we can get those in the chat. But when I asked him, what would you like to speak about? This was the topic he, uh, uh, he uh, offered. And since we have had nothing on this um, in the entire lecture series, it's my great pleasure and thrill to have David here. And hopefully sometime we'll be able to see you in person. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for this invitation to speak. I'll be talking about an issue that I've just started to work on, both for my own teaching and research, so I look forward to hearing your reactions, thoughts, and advice. Over the past months, physicians concerned about the climate crisis have been on an emotional roller coaster. Last fall, during the COP26 climate conference, physicians received unprecedented attention as activists communicated the ways in which climate change would be a threat, uh, would be a public health crisis. But since that time, there has been one report after another suggesting that humans will fail to act in time to avert a catastrophe. Have physicians somehow failed to inform the public and energize political action about what might become the greatest health threat of the 21st century? This raises a more general question for medical ethics. When physicians become aware of a significant threat to health, what obligations do they carry, either as individuals or as members of a profession, to advocate for social and political change that could improve health? Now, this question about the ethics of professional obligation is one that has come up repeated from, repeatedly for me over the past 15 years. In 2005, Harvard Medical School revised its curriculum 
and implemented a required two-month social science course. I have led the social medicine portion of this curriculum. The basic idea of social medicine is that healthcare will be more effective and more likely to achieve health equity if physicians attend to the social, economic, and political contexts in which patients live, fall sick, and seek medical care. Or, as the New York Times wrote in its recent obituary for Jack Geiger, doctors should use their expertise and moral authority not just to treat illness, but also to change the conditions that made people sick in the first place. When we teach social medicine at Harvard, we often ask the students to read this article, which lays out the different opportunities for social action by physicians and asks them to think about what they see as their professional obligations and professional aspirations. It is clear from their responses that there's a wide range of feelings among medical students about this notion of professional obligation. When Paul Farmer used to lecture, he would call on students to make a preferential option for the poor. Some students would cheer, others would protest, arguing that a required course at a medical school should not push Marxist liberation theology. The advent of the comfortable care organizations after 2010 allowed us to preserve, preserve Paul's mission, but market it differently. We explained to students that if you are going to be held accountable for the outcomes your patients achieve, you need to focus your attention on the patients who are at risk for the worst outcomes, and that's usually the poor. Students have no problem with this logic as it engages with their own self-interest. So what obligations do physicians have to advocate for social change relevant for health? I can imagine how a philosopher might go about thinking about this, but that's not my talent. I approach this question instead as a historian. I look for precedents that might shed light onto this question and inform our judgments. And I have been especially interested in this as we confront the climate crisis. As I said, by many measures, the events of last fall were a triumph for medical advocacy about the climate crisis. In a show of force, the editors of the world's leading medical journals came together to publish a powerful statement about the, the climate crisis. Health concerns featured prominently at the summit and in media coverage of the summit. Many of the physician advocates returned home afterwards and were energized about the prospects for meaningful action to improve the climate. But now, six months later, it's hard to remain optimistic. In fact, we seem to be backsliding. Carbon dioxide and methane are now both at record levels. The war in Ukraine has left the United States racing to export more liquefied natural gas to Europe, even though this is a leakier mode of transportation than the Russian pipelines. Sarah Palin and her call to drill baby drill are running for office again. As a society, we clearly need to do more. And so my question for today is, do physicians need to do more as well? In the time I have this afternoon, I will briefly describe a few precedents in which medical advocacy contributed to concerted social and political action. These demonstrate what is possible. I will then trace the history of physician advocacy about the climate crisis with an eye on the ethical arguments embedded in this effort. I hope these comments provide a basis for constructive thought about my core question. Physicians have been advocating about the climate crisis now for 30 years. Their efforts have not achieved the desired success. Do we have an obligation to do more or to do something different? And if so, what? Now, the early history of physician advocacy for social reform remains lost in the mists of time. Many historians go back to many historians of social medicine trace the field back to the mid 19th century and the work of Rudolf Virchow. Some go back to Johann Peter Frank and his idea of the medical police. I'm now advising a PhD advisee who is an early modernist whose work will push this back further into the 18th century and possibly even into 17th century Italy. And I suspect that earlier examples could be found, whether in Europe, the Muslim world, or in China. The trail becomes easier to follow after the 1840s. Social reformers, notably Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, used the poor health of workers to motivate their own political arguments. Public health reformers like Edwin Chadwick rallied city administrators to implement reforms to improve urban sanitation. They tackled water, sewers, and other health threats. 
Diseases that had once been common, especially tuberculosis and cholera, could be controlled. Well, what was the secret of the success of these late 19th century reformers? In part, it was the obviousness of the problem. 19th century cities were nightmarish places. Urban denizens were disgusted by the conditions in which they lived and the multi-sensory assault that they faced. In the aftermath of the Civil War, US reformers comp capitalized on new faith in the power of urban and national governance. Their interventions, including waterworks and sewers, provided tangible, tangible benefits that everybody could enjoy. Clean water, clean food, and several generations later, eventually clean air. New health threats soon followed, most significantly the advent of cigarettes. Physicians were slow to recognize the risk. Many of them smoked themselves and were, were reluctant to believe that tobacco could be dangerous. Some were even complicit in the marketing of cigarettes. Thankfully, as has now been well documented, a few thoughtful and brave physicians recognized the signal in their clinical data and published reports that documented the health risks of tobacco. They also advocated on a national stage with Surgeon General Luther Terry releasing his report on smoking and health in January 1964. This precipitated a slow but now very significant change in American behavior. Smoking rates have fallen from over 50% in 1960 to roughly 15% today. Another success played out in parallel, the effort to improve highway safety. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader receives a lot of credit for this work, but many others contributed, including physicians, most famously William Haddon. He helps to develop what has become known as the public health approach to social problems. Researchers can document the impact of a health threat, identify structural solutions, and then marshal the political reform needed to implement them. In this case, the automotive industry and public works departments implemented seatbelts, speed limits, and guardrails, and these and many other interventions have substantially reduced the number of deaths per mile driven. The 1960s gave rise to another advocacy effort, one directly relevant for the climate crisis, the medical crusade against nuclear war. In 1961, a group of physicians based in Boston founded Physicians for Social Responsibility. In a fascinating act of advocacy, they published a series of articles in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1962 to call attention to the horror of nuclear attacks. One of the articles uh, described in great detail what would happen uh, if Boston was attacked in the way that the Soviet uh, military had planned in the case of a nuclear war. Essentially, anyone who lives in the suburbs of Boston would be annihilated instantly. They convincingly argued that there could be no meaningful medical response to a nuclear attack, in large part because an attack on American cities would destroy most of our medical infrastructure and workforce in the early moments of the nuclear attack. They argued that the only possible way to survive a nuclear war was to prevent a nuclear war. This advocacy campaign lost some steam in the late 1960s, but was revitalized in the 1970s through a collaboration between US and Soviet cardiologists who established a new group in 1980, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Just five years later, they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Now you could ask, it'd be hard to prove, but it's reasonable to argue that this physician advocacy did have an impact on the eventual nuclear detente between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And it's certainly plausible that their efforts contributed to the growing consensus that no one would win a nuclear war. Now, of course, there are countless other cases in which physicians have engaged in advocacy to achieve social and legislative reform. Reproductive rights, gun control, substance use, LGBTQ rights, distracted driving, vaping, many others. Again, there's concern now that there's backsliding on some of these fronts, but the effort has been made and sustained over many decades, often with considerable legislative and, and social successes. Medical societies, not just individual physicians, have often engaged, although usually more cautiously than individual physicians have done. Now these cases each raise an important question. Was this health advocacy for social change ever felt to be a professional obligation, 
something that all physicians should pursue as part of a career in medicine? Or was this kind of advocacy something pursued only by a few motivated physicians? I don't know if histories have yet been written at the resolution that would be required to answer that question, whether about urban sanitation, tobacco control, road safety, nuclear war, abortion, or any of the others. You know, for instance, even basic questions, when did physicians make talking to patients about tobacco a routine part of a clinical history and physical? Did any physicians ever bring nuclear adv anti-nuclear advocacy into the exam room? I don't know, but you could recover this, especially through careful oral histories. It could be the case that an obligation for social and political advocacy has never been widely felt and that has been mostly seen as the domain of a few motivated individuals. And this brings me to the climate crisis. Physician concern with the environment is of course as old as medicine itself. One of the most famous Hippocratic texts, Airs, Waters, and Places, advised physicians to attend to all aspects of the environment, to the seasons, the direction of the winds, and the quality of soil and water. When Europeans established global empires starting in the late 15th century, health concerns were front and central for them. Imperial powers wanted to know that they needed to know how to make the tropics a safe place for European rule and economic exploitation. And there are many examples of this literature. James Lynn's essay on the diseases incidental to Europeans in hot climates, published in 1768, sought to assuage the, the anxieties that Europeans had about moving to the tropics and teach them how to manage those fears. Such work eventually gave rise to the field of tropical medicine, a medical specialty that made imperialism possible. Now this work from Hippocrates through Lind asked an important question. How should you think about disease risk when you move to a different environment? But the inverse question has also become important. How do you think about disease risk when the climate changes around you? Now a case could be made that this kind of thinking began in 17th century London with a dawning recognition of the toxic effects of coal-powered industrialization. It certainly became a substantial concern during the dramatic changes in urban life triggered by the industrial, re industrial re revolution in 19th century European and North American cities. Now, I don't think anyone has yet written a full history of physician involvement in the debates about air pollution. There certainly were many physicians who sounded the alarm about the consequences of burning coal and the smoke and sulfur dioxide that was produced. But there were also many physicians who took the side of industry. One, for instance, who worked in Birmingham, sorry about my dog in the background. One, one who worked in, in Birmingham, Alabama, a steel town, argued that smoke was safe because it was sterile. It had been produced in the fires of a furnace and therefore was free of bacteria. Now in the world of, 19th century, of early 20th century public health, which was fully in the thrall of bacteriology, there was a certain logic to thinking that smoke must be safe because it was sterile. Uh, it's clearly not how we would think about the problem today. Now the discourse on the health effects of environmental pollution and de de degradation really came into its own in the 1960s. Many factors contributed to this. One was the fear of atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. Another was the enormous impact of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And another was the occurrence of dramatic and lethal smoke emergencies, most famously the Great Fog of London in December 1952 that killed thousands of people. Physicians and epidemiologists expanded their studies of the health effects of air pollution, first in England and then in the United States. The World Health Organization soon followed this lead. Legislative action followed as well, most famously for the case of the United States, with the Clean Air Act amendments of 1970, which create the EPA and empower it uh, to take on the challenge of air pollution. Some of those precedents are now being challenged in the Supreme Court, and it remains to see what will happen with the Clean Air Act. And you could also make the case, as it has been recently done by historians, that the Clean Air Act amendments were passed not primarily to improve the atmosphere, but as part of Nixon's political strategy 
uh, Hubert Humphrey had, had claimed the environment as his own campaign issue. And so Nixon decided he had to do something aggressive on the climate to outfrank uh, Humphrey and <laughs> ensure his reelection in 1972. Now, the first UN conference on the human environment held in June 1972 focused attention on the threat of environmental pollution. Physicians start to write explicitly about the health risks. Australian immunologist turned ecologist Stephen Boyden feared that, quote, trends in the relationship between human society and the total environment constitute a serious threat to the survival of civilization and mankind. Boyden said that this was a problem that humans had brought on themselves. The use of fossil fuels had increased to such an extent that the integrity of the biosphere as a whole is now considered by many ecologists to be in jeopardy. Some physicians, however, continued to see the weather and climate as something beyond human control. George Birch, for instance, was a prominent American cardiologist who himself had studied the impact of weather on the heart disease, especially on the incidence of myocardial infarction. Writing in JAMA in 1972, he noted that, quote, climate and weather, important environmental factors that influence the health of the people of America, receive relatively little attention as health problems. Although pollution may be controlled, climate and weather cannot be, and therefore man cannot escape entirely the stresses of weather and climate. As he explained, to a large extent, we are truly at the mercy of the elements. Man must learn to maintain the best possible health in spite of his climate and weather by providing a satisfactory artificial environment, housing with heating, air conditioners, and fans, proper clothing, and healthful working conditions. The idea that weather just happened and that we simply needed to adapt to it remained widespread in the 1970s and 1980s. For instance, over the course of the 1980s, researchers at the Centers for Disease Control published a series of reports about heat-related mortality in American cities in the summer. They highlighted the particular risk faced by city dwellers who were poor, elderly, or had pre-existing conditions. But none of these discussions invoked any notion of global warming or climate change. In a case of remarkably unfortunate timing, on June 30th, 1995, CDC researchers re reviewed over 5,000 heat-related deaths between 1979 and 1992 and concluded that such mortality was readily preventable. A disastrous heat wave, wave struck Chicago two weeks later and killed over 500 people. In the aftermath, some remarkable statements were made. Chicago's deputy health commissioner displayed a startling ignorance of the CDC's reports, noting, what we have not appreciated before is that heat can kill, even though that had been documented just two weeks previously by the CDC. Other officials, however, were paying closer attention. Back in 1987, the UN's World Commission on Environment and Development, chaired by physician Gro Harlan Brundtland, alerted epidemiologists and others to the ways in which our abuse of the Earth's ecosystem threatened human health. A series of important reports were published in 1989. In April of that year, Lancet published what I think is the first editorial uh, that my colleagues and I at least have found in a prominent medical journal explicitly about the health effects of the climate change. It warned of a global environmental disaster on the order of the AIDS pandemic or nuclear war but more certain since it proceeded from physics rather than politics. The author argued that there was no time for further research. Fundamental changes had to be made in transportation, energy, and agriculture to protect the ecosystems on which human survival depended. In December of that year, the Environmental Protection Agency submitted its own report to Congress about the potential effects of climate change. The nearly 500 page report contained one brief chapter on health effects. The author of this chapter, Janice Longstreth, later described how she had found a voluminous literature on climate and health going back as far as the time of Hippocrates. In her chapter, she described the basic findings, focusing on vector-borne diseases, and called for more research. In that same month, Boston physician Alexander Leaf published his own analysis in the New England Journal of Medicine. He noted that while the subject of climatic and environmental changes that result from human activity has been much in the news recently, the impact of environmental change on health and the survival of humans 
has received relatively little direct attention. Now, Leaf himself had been active in both Physicians for Social Responsibility and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And in 1986, he had updated IPPNW's 1962 analyses of the medical consequences of a nuclear war. He highlighted new research on the estimated casualties of a nuclear attack, the short and long-term effects of radiation, and the new problem of post-blast immune dysfunction. A full third of his article examined what looked to be the most deadly consequence of any nuclear war, global starvation from the disruptive agriculture, disrupted agriculture that would follow a nuclear attack. He became interested in the climate crisis around that time and saw direct parallels between nuclear and climate advocacy. Like the authors of the 1962 articles about the consequences of nuclear war, he believed that if physicians could educate the public and political leaders, that political reform would follow. As he wrote in a 1996 memoir, if people understood the health threats of environmental degradation, they would personalize the consequences of these threats to their own health and survival and demand appropriate controls through government regulations. In pursuit of this mission to educate with the expectation that political change would follow, he described a series of health consequences of the climate crisis, increased mortality related to heat, air pollution, ultraviolet radiation, infectious diseases, and again, especially the disrupted agriculture and the result of global starvation. He wrote that the overall consequences of the climate crisis would be disastrous. In the early 1990s, in the lead up to the Earth Summit in Rio, reports about climate change appeared frequently. In 1990, the IPCC re released its first report on the scientific consensus, one that mentioned possible health consequences only in passing. The WHO prepared its own report, Our World, Our Health, as a briefing document for the Rio summit. After the June conference, the Union of Concerned Scientists delivered a stark warning to humanity, pointing out that a great change in our stewardship of the earth and the life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. The emergence of this new domain of climate advocacy created challenges for groups like Physicians for Social Responsibility and IPPNW. They debated whether they should keep their attention on the existential threat of nuclear war, or possibly sensing the end or hoping for the end of the Cold War, they wondered whether it made sense possibly to redirect their attention to the climate crisis. And both groups had active debates about what to do. Physicians for Social Responsibility decided to create a task force on the environment. And after a contentious meeting held at MIT in 1992, it published its own report in 1993 with Eric Chivian as one of the lead authors. Chivian, who spearheaded this effort, then created a Center for Health in the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School in 1994. Many physicians in Europe, North America, and Australia worked along these lines in the 1990s. They published articles that highlighted the health of threats of global warming, largely following the talking points laid out in the initial work by Longstreth and Leaf. Lancet was especially active in this area, for instance, publishing a series of 11 articles in, on health and climate change from October to December 1933. The journal Medicine and War published a special collection dedicated to climate change in 1995. Individual researchers also published reviews and commentaries that sought to keep the problem in the public eye. It's not clear to me what effect any of this advocacy had. <clears throat> and while I have not yet completed a systematic analysis, my sense is that there isn't that much new in the big picture medical writing about this issue. Details have been filled in with research over the past 30 years, and the causal claims that physicians have made become more convincing, but the basic arguments generally cover the same basic ground. Climate crisis and increased temperature will dis disrupt the food supply, change the distribution of vector-borne diseases, create climate refugees, and others. Ozone depletion received a lot of attention early on in the late 1980s, early 1990s, but that has dissipated in light of successful controls of chlorofluorocarbons. Acid rain also received attention in these reports in the 1980s and 1990s, but again, that issue has faded from view. I think those are the two success stories in an otherwise grim history 
of the continuing concern about the health effects of the climate crisis. The effort received an infusion of energy over the past decade. In 2014, with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation and then the Wellcome Trust, Lancet editor Richard Horton convened a commission on planetary health. This led to a new round of publications in both Lancet and The Economist, and a new journal uh, dedicated to the problem, Lancet Planetary Health. Another group of advocates channeled some of this energy to establish the Planetary Health Alliance, which is now hosted at the Harvard School of Public Health. This is in large part a platform for education. It hosts workshops, publishes research reports, and advocates for actionable steps that can be taken by individuals and their societies. And it looks like University of Chicago has a similar center, the Energy Policy Institute, which collaborates uh, with researchers at Berkeley and Rutgers to produce the Climate Action Lab. And the Climate Action Lab is engaged in research and education about the societal as well as the health costs of the climate crisis. Climate advocacy has also been shaped by the renewed efforts to work for race justice that have come in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. This has led to increasing discussions of the problem of environmental racism in the climate crisis. As with so many things in American society, the burden of disease and risk that will follow climate change will not be distributed equitably. This was demonstrated powerfully by Hurricane Katrina, in which the French Quarter and the wealthy white neighborhoods were largely spared, while the majority Black Lower Ninth Ward was flooded and devastated. Researchers have now shown how the long history of racism has left many legacies for environmental health in this country, affecting everything from the distribution of asthma to who's at risk for heat-related mortality. We must recognize the social construction of vulnerability, especially the disastrous structures of social inequality and systemic racism that influence our relationships with environmental risk. And all of these advocates have now produced many resources for physicians who might want to engage with the climate crisis. The Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change prepared this policy briefing for the United States. It encourages healthcare systems to adapt to become more resilient in the face of climate change. It calls on doctors to advocate for policies that will mitigate the effects of climate change, especially on the most vulnerable people. It even gives concrete advice for how doctors can discuss the climate crisis with their patients for conversations about the risks of heat, about air quality, about preparing for natural disasters, or how to manage the growing problem of climate anxiety. Victor Zhao, now president of the National Academy of Medicine, published a manifesto last year to call on the healthcare system to decarbonize itself. He noted that healthcare is responsible for 8.5% of the US carbon footprint and described several approaches to addressing this problem, making the supply chain more efficient, improving healthcare delivery, making sure that medical education takes these problems seriously, and then working on policy financing and metrics to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Now, a cranky skeptic might look at that number and say, oh, that's interesting. Healthcare is actually a relatively green industry. In 2021, healthcare reached a new high consuming 19.7% of the US GDP. That suggests that its share of carbon emissions, 8.5%, is less than half of its share of economic activity. I think that's a bit of a rhetorical sleight of hand. Even if healthcare is relatively green, there is much that could be done within healthcare to improve things, especially in the pharmaceutical sector, which accounts for the largest share of healthcare's carbon footprint. I'm currently working on a paper with a colleague to estimate how much of this carbon footprint is contributed by the problem of non-adherence, specifically of prescriptions that are filled by patients producing the carbon footprint, but never actually ingested. And I think that number is going to be substantial. But that said, you know, the main goal of climate advocacy in healthcare isn't to clean up and decarbonize medicine itself, but to use arguments about the health effects of the climate crisis to motivate broader social and political reforms. Unfortunately, recent surveys have shown that most physicians are not yet ready to engage. This survey of several thousand international physicians found that while between 86 to 90% of survey respondents 
believe that physicians have a responsibility to alert both the public and political leaders about the health effects of the climate crisis. Only 37% of them said that they were actually willing to do so and that they would need further information before being willing to engage. And over half of physicians simply said that they simply did not have time in their work to engage with Physicians have long since recognized and described the health effects of the climate crisis, which are likely to be dire. They have recognized the ways in which this risk is not distributed evenly. People who are already the most marginalized in society are the ones who are most likely to suffer. And physicians have identified credible interventions, things that could be done at the clinical and policy level to try to improve our future prospects. But advocates, myself included, I'm guilty as charged, mostly seem to be focused on continuing to do the kinds of things that we have done for a generation, educating the public and our leaders, publishing articles, describing the health effects of climate change, and then hoping that decisive action will be taken. Of course, as is often said, one definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result but I'm afraid that's what we seem to be doing in this case. The historical record has repeatedly made clear that while it is always important to collect more data and better evidence, evidence itself will never be enough to bring about social change. New evidence might help us refine the arguments and propose new interventions, but the case for climate action is already quite strong. In fact, after one of the IPC report, IPCC reports last winter, several scientists even called for a moratorium on further climate research, since it's not clear what, if any difference, more evidence would make. Since we haven't acted on the abundant evidence that we have right now, why should we think that we will act, we'll make a little bit more evidence? Now, I don't, don't know if they meant this, uh, seriously, or if this was just, a, again, a rhetorical gambit uh, to bring attention to this problem. But I think there is something to be said uh, for their basic position. Given how much we know, is it likely that knowing a bit more will make a difference? Well, what more could be done? Uh, and this is where I come up short. Physicians could engage in more legislative advocacy but given the current political gridlock in Congress and the opposition of certain Democratic senators to any action on climate change, it seems that legislative advocacy at this moment in the United States might be an exercise in futility. The war in Ukraine, of course, makes a bad situation worse. Some of you might have seen that Biden yesterday announced a plan to allow summer sales of ethanol, knowing full well that doing so will worsen problems with air pollution and smog in the summer months, which is why summer sales of ethanol have long been banned. Physicians could also target local communities to build grassroots interest in the climate crisis, and many are already doing that. But will enough physicians see this as their professional obligation and mobilize to make a difference? And will local communities prioritize health effects amid many other competing interests? Again, it's hard to be optimistic. Everyone's preoccupation these days has been to decrease the price of gasoline, even though increasing the price of gasoline is probably an excellent policy intervention if you cared seriously about the climate crisis. In England, some physicians have mobilized as part of the Extinction Rebellion, which began staging protests and civil disobedience in London in 2018. In September 2019, for instance, some doctors and nurses blocked the entrance to the United Kingdom's Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. Some glued themselves to the door to prevent people from coming and going. Others staged a die-in. Several of these physicians were, resisted, were arrested for their civil disobedience. This prompted Richard Horton, still the editor of The Lancet, to come to their defense. He posted a strongly worded video manifesto in which he argued forcefully that physicians had an obligation to do more. As he said, doctors and all health professionals have a responsibility and obligation 
to engage in all kinds of nonviolent social protest to address the climate emergency. That is the duty of a doctor. Well, physicians, or really all humans, need to do something more, something new. You don't need a crystal ball to foresee a future of enormous regret. I think it's a reasonable prediction that in 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, that physicians, researchers, and the public uh, will look back at 2022 and wish that we had all done more then to, pre to pre prevent the future that these people will be living in 2030, 2050, or 2070. And if you can reasonably foresee that future regret, wouldn't any moral person want to act now to change that course to prevent a future that we will all regret? I think so, but I just don't know what exactly we could do to change that course. I remain stuck in my own silo conducting historical research that seeks to understand why societies haven't done more to respond to threats like air pollution over the past century or to the climate crisis today. But I suspect that such research will have a modest impact at best. In 2019, several other historians and I published this piece in which we argued that in as much as history ever teaches a straightforward lesson, the message of this particular history may be that more evidence alone will not compel action given how non-rational our current policy sphere seems to be. The imperative for climate action requires physicians to mobilize politically, as they have done with many cases in the past, and become fierce advocates for major social and economic change. A truly ethical relationship with the planet that we inhibit so precariously, and with the generations that will follow us, demands nothing less than major social and economic change. I just don't yet know what more we could do to make that happen. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and perspectives. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, David, I kind of, first of all, the talk was terrific and it was really everything I hoped because it was a beautiful, summary of um, what's gone on and how you're a hundred percent right that um, it's not a question of just getting more information. As a matter of fact, I think that in some ways your talk is a magnificent example of thinking about it, you know, over time and the fact that there is more than enough information. The challenge is how do we move from there to advocacy and um, I don't have the easy answer. I think, you know, we start and, you know, I mean, if you think about how, you know, social, um, you know, you can look to people like Malcolm Gladwell and, and creative intellectuals, how you start social movements and how things, you know, are um, changed by disruptive and are not linear, but um, I don't have the easy answer. Um, on the other hand, those of us who've traveled throughout the world, all you have to do is go to a country like India and be exposed <clears throat> to the air pollution there. And you just get like, it, it literally and figuratively takes your breath away and say, oh, please God, whatever we can do to prevent this. So um, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I certainly don't have the answer, but I'd be happy to um, navigate the chat. So Tarek, you're on, you're on deck. Okay, good. Thanks. So basically, I would say I have three separate quick question. Uh, one would be a like, uh, is, it, is it because we haven't made a concrete connection between uh, climate change and health? Everything is looks a little distant, abstract, may or may not happen, like multiple step process. It's not like if you get needle stick, you're getting infection, something like that. So for patient, it's hard. I mean, they out of they they do everyone does things out of self interest or self preservation. So they're not going to make abstract thought process. So so that's one. And number two, have you looked at some of the guidelines of different societies? How we do things like in the OR, which is a lot of wastage, we do things which are done by Joint Commission or other societies, and we are doing it. 
which don't have hard signs and we should change something in an immediate way so we don't dispose so much like everything is disposable we try to throw away things we don't have to clean them and the final third question would be would it affect the outcome or uh, the state stature or whatever you want to call or relation to the patient if when when where should we draw the line so that doctors don't become activists and affect patient relation so what should be the benchmark of the science where the societies have a position paper so the physician when he says something be that climate change doesn't look like he's an activist but he's doing a professional job so thanks yeah those are all they're all, all great questions uh as i'm thinking of answer, i'll just say one one quick thing in re, re, uh response to the comment that Mindy made, you know, air pollution uh, in the U.S. at least is one success story. Uh, many cities, you know, Chicago because of railroads, Pittsburgh and St. Louis because of steel, uh, had air in the not too distant past, 1930s, 1940s, that was as bad as the worst of the air is now in India. Um, and the U.S. did make concerted action to change that uh, over the objections of industry. Uh, in part because uh, Richard Nixon was a schemer and saw reasons to do so, even though, though he was a Republican who had no prior interest in the environment. And so sometimes it's unexpected events, again, a non-rational policy sphere that does lead to decisive action. Uh, as for Tariq's questions, uh, the first one is, is it lack of, is it the, the, the health effects of climate crisis feel too remote? Historically, I think that is certainly true. And, you know, the, the contrast, you know, why was there public support for investments in infrastructure and waterworks in the late 19th century? That was because the effects of that were not seen at all as remote. Uh, drink contaminated water, get explosive diarrhea from cholera, you could be dead 24 hours later. Uh, and so there was a very immediate cause and effect of both the insult and also the intervention. All of a sudden, major cities in Western Europe and North America had you know clean water, clean clean running tap water, and everyone could appreciate that. Um, whereas you know telling people to switch to electric cars, uh, no one is going to perceive a, a health related benefit from that. Or if more people composted, or were better about recycling, no one is going to experience an immediate climate benefit. So the is issue of distant uh, of distance between cause and effect is significant. Um, Recently, there's been some change in the public dialogue around that, mostly because of the seeming intensification of storms of various sorts. Fire, fire, forest fires are worse. Uh, hurricanes contain more water and more powerful winds. You, you may be experiencing this sooner than I will, but apparently North Dakota is now forecast to get 30 inches of snow, which is an unusual blizzard for mid-May. Uh, and, and these things do have health effects. Uh, people die from hurricanes, people die from forest fires uh, or from the, from the air pollution that comes off the forest fires. And so if these things really do intensify as predicted, it could be that that will be the mechanism by which the effects feel proximate enough to motivate change. Uh, but again, it will never be as immediate as, and obvious as it was with urban water in the 19th century. Uh, as for guidelines, you know, are, do, thing, do groups like uh, Jayco make hospitals do things that make things worse. Uh, I was astonished when I looked at the analyses of the carbon footprint of, of healthcare, because I assumed that OR waste must be like the number one cause because it's so dramatic at the end of every operation to see how much stuff gets thrown away. Uh, and a certain percentage of medical waste gets incinerated. Uh, but apparently the problem really is in pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, most pharmaceuticals are fossil fuel derivatives. Uh, you know, the, the great pharmaceutical revolution in the 1950s with antibiotics and psychiatric medications, those were all coal tar derivatives. Uh, and so uh, most drugs that get produced have a carbon backbone and most carbon backbones are coming from oil or coal. coal. Uh, and the, apparently that's where the lion's share of uh, healthcare's carbon comes from. And that's one that physicians actually really could do something about. There've been longstanding concerns about overprescription by physicians, non-adherence by patients, uh, potentially you could reduce a lot of healthcare's carbon footprint with no adverse effects because what you'd be cutting is the stuff that isn't needed anyway or isn't being consumed anyway. The challenge is, is figuring that out. You can't 
predict in advance which of the prescriptions the patient is going to consume or not. So it's hard to do, but there's a lot, there is some low hanging fruit out there. And then the last question about uh, will activism disrupt a sense of professionalism uh, in patient doctor relationships? A few years ago, I think the answer I would have given was that that distinction between activism and professionalism shouldn't exist, that activism should be seen as part of the professional obligation of physicians. Uh, it's not considered unprofessional anymore to ask patients if they smoke. It's considered appropriate medical care to ask patients if they smoke. Uh, but the events of the past few years have made it clear how sensitive uh, or how easily patient-doctor relationships can get politicized, whether it was Florida's efforts to try to bar physicians from inquiring about guns in homes, uh, which was enacted and then thrown out by courts, uh, or the recent efforts to ban uh, gender-conforming care. Uh, and so the patient-doctor relationships, like so much in this society, have become politicized. And so I think in 2022, I would have to agree with Tariq that that is a concern. Uh, if physicians did start to tell their patients to stop driving gas guzzlers, that would be seen by a lot of patients in the United States as inappropriate and unprofessional activism. Uh, maybe physicians could head that off through education and advocacy by explaining why it is that they ask these questions, but that would require concerted work uh, and that would be working against a lot of headwinds, I think. Thank you. John, I'll let you um, take the floor. Unmute yourself. I, I really liked your report. The only problem that I see is Fox News isn't included or any of the um, major producers of fossil fuels, Exxon, et cetera. So my question is possibly seen as kind of naive and silly, but why not start thinking in terms of meetings, monthly meetings in Chicago at AMA headquarters where um, a panel, a, a quote unquote expert panel of doctors and climate people meet with Fox News one month, um, Exxon and, and uh, Shell another month. In other words, based on the people that I am in contact with, and of course, all of that's limited because of COVID, it's astonishing how little how many Americans have so little trust in scientists of any kind, including doctors. And the doctor problem has been compounded by the reluctance to be vaccinated. So all the academic stuff is great and obviously needs to be done, but is it possible that what we're missing is we don't have a rush the equivalent of Rush Limbaugh daily meeting with exposing Americans to the kind of experts who could help change the tenor of the whole conversation in America. In, in some way, I, I, I agree completely. And I think that's the source of a lot of pessimism that people feel now about this. Um, in some way, what you're describing is outreach to two different groups that I, I think would have to be handled distinctly. So one is, is there a way you could engage with the various fossil fuel interests, whether it's ExxonMobil, Coke Industries, coal mines, uh, and would it be possible to educate them and get them on board with a vis vis uh, vision in which they decided to uh, decarbonize themselves. Uh, you know, the challenge there is that you're asking people, companies to act massively against their financial self-interest. Uh, 
and there are some people who have called called for a policy in which all carbon that's currently in the ground stays in the ground and we should stop using coal uh, and petroleum. There are obviously pragmatic uh, obstacles to that. Uh, no one has figured out how to make a 747 fly with solar power yet. Uh, but you know, people are working on those questions. But what that would re require is asking people to leave vast uh, uh, assets undeveloped. Uh, you know, the, the, the total value of the world's fossil fuel reserves is enormous uh, and be very hard for the people who own those reserves just to leave them there. Uh, there are various uh, low-grade things going on. I've known some people who have been involved with a form of quiet activism in which when, when the coal economy was suffering a few years ago, uh, you could actually purchase coal land uh, or coal rights quite affordably. And so people worked uh, with Nature Conservancy and others and started basically secretly raising money and secretly buying up coal land on the cheap. Uh, and then they would buy the land and then flip it into a conservation easement so it could never be developed. And so apparently some share of coal reserves in Virginia have now been bought, bought up and covered by conservation easements. I, I think that's a sort of small change in the global fossil fuel, but you know things like that could be done. Uh, <clears throat> But that requires convincing people to leave a lot of money in the ground. Uh, you could not be able to convince them to do that if they didn't see petroleum simply as an asset, but as an asset that was going to cause horrendous health consequences and everything else down the road. Uh, and if you could put a carbon tax on some of these resources, it would change the companies, how the companies value their assets, and that would be useful. Um, but for a variety of different reasons, carbon taxes are unpopular in the US. Could you do anything about entities like Fox News? Uh, and part of the problem is you know, free speech and Fox News can say whatever Rupert, Rupert Murdoch wants Fox News to say. And there's not much, not much, not much that could be done. Uh, will his children uh, pursue a different political course than he has? I don't know, that remains to be seen. Uh, presumably, People like Tucker Carlson say what they do because they believe that there is a market for it and it energizes their viewers. Could you educate their viewers in such a way that they no longer wanted to hear anti-climate crisis diatribes from Fox News? That would force Fox News to change its tune. And then the question is, well, how do you get access to those people to try to convince them that there actually is a scientific consensus that the climate crisis is happening? Um, and again, you know, there's been some hope. Uh, Farmers are close observers of the climate, and there's a growing number of farmers who are expressing concern about what's going on. Uh, fishermen are close observers of ocean conditions, and there's growing concern amongst them. In the Gulf of Maine, for reasons that aren't clear, is the body of water on Earth that is warming up faster than any other, and that will likely wipe out the Maine lobster fishery uh, within my lifetime. Uh, and so things like that are starting to get attention of people uh, who might otherwise be Fox News viewers. And so that, again, slight reason for hope, but it's hard to be too excited, but it's a very difficult challenge. We have to figure out some way to break through to both of those groups. Jake, you have something to um, add to the conversation? Uh, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Um, I really greatly appreciate the uh, comment that we need more clinicians just to change their opinion about this as an issue that is within not just their purview, but their responsibility to address. I think that changing ideology is a really important aspect of addressing climate change as uh, a existential crisis that we have to face. Uh, to your question though, of, of you know, what do we do about this? I think that with these kind of uh, system uh, level issues that, I mean, you just mentioned farming and fisheries, and you know, there's so many other areas that this uh, could be tackled from that the question for, for healthcare then becomes, how can we lead from example? How can we uh, focus on our own sector? Because this is a problem that's going to need to be tackled sector by sector. We can't just put in one big uh, law that's going to just handle climate change. And so I guess my question for you then is, is there any kind of precedent 
where organizations within healthcare have started to come together to talk about what can be done uh, on a systems level approach within healthcare, you know, within individual um, hospitals, uh, within different organizations, starting to network to talk about what can be done, how can we lead by example? Because I, again, I think that ideology change is important as a kind of like a ground level to think that we need to do something about this. But then the next step is what can we do within our sector to then uh, use that uh, almost as like a presentation to say, look, this is what other sectors should be doing as well. Um, and then I, I think you're also right about the, the need to, you know, again, push for some more policy change at a, a higher level of the, the issue. But I think that kind of in the immediate, the sense uh, of urgency, I think that we need to be focusing on is like, what can we do right now? And I'm just curious, again, is there any effort out there at the moment to try to put some sort of network together to address that? So a bunch of different issues there. So the, I think there are emerging efforts, the, uh, both within institutions, between institutions, and also in professional societies to do this. Uh, I think a, a lot of professional organizations now have working groups having conversations about this. I think many healthcare uh, entities also have working groups. Uh, this is, is, it's hard not to because the, the, the problem is definitely looming. Has there been much action? Is there much to show for it? Uh, not much that I have seen, but there certainly could be stuff that I've been missing. And you'll, you'll see news stories periodically. I heard this was a, either about Cleveland Clinic or Intermountain Health or the big one in Puget Sound uh, talked about you know, various green initi initiatives that they're doing. Uh, and I think you're right that there is some kind of virtual, virtue signaling that could be done. So even if healthcare acting unilaterally is not going to solve the, the national carbon footprint, uh, if physicians were to say, well, you think this is really important and here's what our own institutions have done, uh, that would both be constructive and it would also signal the importance of this in a way that might be more persuasive than simply telling people that it's a problem. Uh, I, mean, I assume there's some things that would be low hanging fruit that would, would signal to patients, you know, any healthcare institution that has a big parking lot could put solar panels over the parking lot. There's no reason not to do that. Uh, and, and solar panels are so cheap these days. And that would be a very subtle signal you know, every time you go to the doctor's office that someone thinks clean energy is important, or you could put in, in windmills uh, at healthcare institutions in the Midwest. Um, the physicians could have conversations with patients uh, about things that patients could be doing. Uh, and again, that would, again, would get it into the patient's consciousness that this is an important uh, issue. <clears throat> There are some healthcare institutions in Boston I know have been talking about you know, trying to imp improve their, uh, to, to make their supply chains greener. Uh, you know, could they do more to recycle? Could they purchase more recycled disposable products? Uh, you know, again, a lot of the gowns that uh, come and go, and you, hospitals have to make the decision, are they gonna go for cloth gowns that get laundered or do they go with disposable gowns? Uh, I don't know what goes into those purchasing decisions. One of the things that's so frustrating is that figuring out the differential carbon cost of those two strategies is actually quite complicated. You know, what's the cost of laundering versus what's the cost of, of disposables? Uh, and so we know uh, economists and supply chain people need to provide better information that can then inform better decisions by hospitals. Uh, but I think if, if hospitals were ever to make a policy change and they'd say, you know, we want to make this change and here's why, uh, and they announced that, again, it would be good press that would help, again, convey this idea that healthcare is taking this issue seriously and other groups uh, should as well. Uh, I do expect we'll see more and more of that over the coming years. You're on deck, Dr. Bob. I was gonna say, just briefly, in terms of what the AMA could do, Ooh. Uh, you know, the, the, the public reach of the AMA's voice comes and goes. Uh, over time, you know, traditionally it has not been a progressive institution. Uh, it's obviously been making a lot of efforts recently to be more progressive. Uh, most of the public action I've seen coming out of the AMA recently has been about issues of race and racism, which is wholly appropriate. Uh, could the AMA start to work to get more attention to the climate crisis uh, or through the climate crisis and environmental racism? I could certainly imagine that being done. Uh, uh, JAMA just announced its new editor yesterday. It'll be interesting to see what direction 
uh, she decides to go with that journal. Also along the lines of what medicine could do to, to lead by example, um, wouldn't it be better for the environment if professional meetings continued on Zoom like they have been? Yeah, and, and again, the, the bit interesting question is like, you know, what's the carbon footprint of the great uh, national and international co commerce of physician meetings? Uh, so yeah, and doing that, you know, and uh, reducing air travel by anyone, not just physicians, is again relatively low hanging fruit. Uh, you know, that certainly my being with you by Zoom today, while slightly less satisfying. Uh, does spare the carbon cost of a round trip flight from Boston to Chicago, uh, you know, which is significant. Uh, lots of physicians, or at least uh, prominent physicians, like to fly business class. And the minute you start flying business class, the carbon footprint of that flight becomes enormous. Uh, what, you, what would need to be considered is what, if anything, significant would be lost by that sociality and collegiality uh, between individuals. Um, the notion that physicians ought to travel to meet with each other has been embedded in the, in the profession for a long time. You start to see surgeon travel clubs in the late 19th, early 20th century, and a variety of them uh, have existed ever after. Surgical travel was, is the most, is the e used to be the easiest to justify because this was actually a method of technique transfer. You could see how someone that could operate uh, and it was easier to convey that uh, in person than just by publishing a description. Uh, but again, a lot of that could now be done fully online. There, there's very good video technology. You could film uh, surgical technique. It's not the same as being there. Uh, if the medical profession switched wholly to online meetings, uh, it would certainly spare physicians massive exposure to, our, to advertising by the pharmaceutical and device industry, and that'd be a good collateral benefit. Uh, <clears throat> there probably would be something hard to quantify that would be lost in the collegiality. And the, the one example that's on my mind is in the case of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. That was an organization that was grounded in relationships uh, between cardiologists and largely in Boston, Leningrad, and, and Moscow. Uh, and those built enduring relationships, and, and, and sometimes they have interesting effects. So some of you might have seen this news coverage. Just recently, James Mueller, uh, who's a local cardiologist here in Boston, <clears throat> who had been a, a Russian studies major in the 1960s before going to medical school. Uh, and so when Bernard Lau and set up IPPNW and started to have meetings with Chazov, his counterpart in the Soviet Union, he brought Mueller along as the translator. Uh, or as an interpreter. So, so Jim has been involved with this since the mid 70s, has very deep connections to senior uh, Soviet and now Russian medical and scientific leaders. And so just last week was invited to speak at the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, in a talk that was broadcast to some extent throughout Russia, uncensored. And so he spoke about the war in Ukraine and the threat of nuclear annihilation. Uh, I worry about what will happen to the people who invited him to give this talk. Uh, but that was a valuable moment of public advocacy. Uh, and I don't think that could have, have happened if he hadn't built those relationships over the decades from being in person. But of course, that talk was made possible by Zoom technology. I mean, he didn't fly to Moscow to give this talk right now. He did it virtually. And so there is an enormous amount that physicians could do. Could do. And, and, and if physicians were to signal, we've decided this is important, we're gonna stop traveling to fancy resorts for our conferences. Uh, that could have a big public impact. Uh, it would save time, it would save money, it would save carbon footprint. Uh, you would lose something hard to quantify, uh, but maybe would learn how to, to, to manage that. We'd be sacrificing something, giving something up. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a trade off, you know, the, what, what share of what takes place at a medical conference is truly educational. And that is, cause that could be done mostly online. 
you know, what are the social benefits? What's the value? And to what extent does it maintain morale? To what extent does it, does it help the campaign against burnout? Uh, you need to think hard about the kinds of things that would be lost if we switched to fully online. Uh, you can certainly imagine uh, a partial implementation of that. Uh, so if, if you were going to a conference and you were really just going to the conference to hear talks and get CME credit, uh, you wouldn't miss that much by doing that online if it was well done online. And so, that, so some, some share of the travel could be dropped, I think, without cost. Uh, but we, we would have to think about the things that would be lost by that. Well, that was absolutely terrific, David. And I think we should give you at least a little bit of downtime um, <laughs> before you have the next session just also for all of us to process. But I think if anything, the, this COVID era has shown that we are living in a period of tremendous change, okay? The last two years have brought around a lot of change. And the way I look at it is the fact that, um, it, you know, what did they say in crisis opportunity, right? So the way change really happens is it often isn't linear, it's disruptive, right? All of a sudden, People can't go into the, the office and all of a sudden, you know, video technology and telephone technology, which has been around for a long time, becomes a viable alternative. So I would argue that we should be using this time to be innovative, creative and thoughtful. So one of the other things just on a personal level is it used to be if you had a conference like this, it was one and done, right? Because everything was in person. If you missed it, it was gone. Now, I think for the foreseeable future, things will at least, you know, once they go back, will probably be hybrid to, to good um, advantage. And I think that, um, but I think the other thing you said is the fact that information is not going to change. You have to actually, advocacy requires a more activist um, potential. And I think living through a time where we have been as a society, both politicized and in some ways radicalized. I mean, it's hard to walk away from the racial issues that are everywhere in medicine. Um, so I just think that this was a terrific talk and a lot of food for thought. And um, I'm going to hit you up for your bibliography, which I think is an amazing resource that I think this group and others like it would really benefit from. So I want to thank you and give you at least a little time to go stretch your legs and get some something to drink before you come back at 1 30. <laughs>